Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's Writer in Residence session with Christina Longden and Kevin Duffy, the founder of Blue Moose Books based in Hebden Bridge. And tonight Chris and Kevin will be talking about the publishing industry and the importance of being an independent publisher. So hello Chris and hello Kevin. Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay, um, but before we start, um, I'd like to share with you a slide which shows some of the uh, Blue Moose books that we've got with Kirkley's Libraries that you're able to borrow. So I'll, I'll just share my screen. There we go. Okay, so there's these books here and also, we've got these lovely books on this slide as well. So these are all available from Kirkley's Libraries um, as e-books. And we've got some more on there that you're able to borrow. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right, so that, those are there. And also, um, I'd like to share a slide with you as well. These titles are all available as ebooks, and uh, some of them are available as paperbacks. Um, so I'll just leave that on screen for a couple of minutes for you to have a look at. So we've got a really good collection of Blue Moose books there. Okay, and we've also got um, so a list of um, Blue Moose books that we have ordered, so they'll be coming soon. Um, so I'll put this list on for a couple of minutes as well for you. Okay. Okay, right. Okay, so I'll hand over to Chris and Kevin now um, to start the session. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Thanks, Thanks for everything. <laughs> Hiya, Kev. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. It's Thursday. What could be better? I'm um, I'm just thinking actually if if um, at the end of this talk, if if anybody's thinking, oh crikey, I I can't remember all those books. All you need to do is go back and watch this um, talk on YouTube, and then you can freeze frame it and write down all the names. But also, if you go to Blue Moose Books, you can write down all the names of the books anyway, and then go to the libraries and type in the books or go and order them. Kev's going to talk later on about um, what you want to do, what you to do if you want to buy the books. Um, I was going to start off actually by reading out all the awards that you've got, Kev, for Blue Moose. Ooh. But then I think we'd probably take an hour just me reading out all. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's some serious, serious award accolades um, that you've achieved in recent years. Um, so I was just basically going to start off by saying that you and I know each other. We met a few years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. I think we actually met in Home Firth because you came very kindly yeah. to do a talk for the Home Firth Writers Group um, with one of your wonderful writers um, who is sadly passed away now, who wrote Nod. Yeah, Adrian, um, Barnes, yeah. Adrian Barnes I mean that was the most amazing evening people still talk about that um, because it was this great two for one Adrian was talking about Nod and his mm -hmm. writing and you were talking about Blue Moose and since then it's just been onward and upward and, and wow amazing successes which were really well deserved and, and one thing that I did want to say was out of everybody that I know in, in the bookish world you are the hardest working person I've ever met um, mm -hmm. and you give so much I of do. your time generously for free because you believe in your books and, and yeah. all your writers that I've met have said the same thing you've got an eye for for picking picking out the best writers with the most unique stories and just believing in them when other publishers don't do that and I think that's that's why your success is just so well deserved. It couldn't have happened to a better person. Um, but yeah, just to say, you and I met at Home with Writers Group, but also through a friend of mine who is one of your writers, Leonora Rustamova, who wrote the amazing Stop, Don't Read This, which is just a fantastic book. And it all began in 2006. So if I can take you back to 2006 and yeah. tell everybody how it all began. Well, I've been... Um... <clears throat> I've been in um, sales and marketing for um, um, publishing much larger publishers since uh, I started out in 1987 with Headline, which is part of Hachette. 
which is the second largest publisher in the world. So I was a sales rep um, and kind of sales manager and used to go, and my job was to go around and present all the new titles that um, Headline were publishing to uh, bookshops uh, and where I'd go to kind of library suppliers uh, and show them the lists for uh, the next six months or the next 12 months. So that was my job. Uh, and I, I worked in London for um, five years. And then um, we moved up to Leeds in uh, 1990. Uh, moved back up north because I got sick of the south. I got sick of work, uh, traveling to work on the tube, etc. And I was still working in, in publishing, still working in sales and marketing. And I remember in, um, it was about um, 2005, going to a library supplier. Uh, and historically, uh, and still, the, the, the two biggest library suppliers um, in the UK uh, were based, one was based in Preston and one was placed, uh, placed in, in Morley. And I remember going to them and, and asking them what the bigger publishers were publishing, what great new voices were out there. Uh, and they were saying um, basically nothing new. Um, the industry had changed, um, and this might be a bit tedious, but I think it's important to say, the industry changed in 1995. Prior to 1995, there was a net book agreement. So the price on the back of a book was the price you paid at the, in the bookshop or in the supermarket. After 1995, uh, booksellers and supermarkets could then discount, and they could discount massively. Uh, and so it meant that the publishers had a smaller portion of the publishing pie to play with. Uh, so instead of getting £10 for a, a book, they were getting £5.50 or £4.50. So you can imagine you've got to do, you, you, you've got to pay your author, you've got to pay your designer, you've got to pay your editor, mm. you've got to pay your designers, uh, distribution, at that £4.50, £5.50. So it meant that the industry became really risk averse. Yeah. So they were finding kind of great new writers, uh, great new stories. They were, and it's a generalization, but it's a truism as well, that they were, they were then replicating, they were publishing books that other publishers um, or other kind of genres have been successful. So they became risk averse. So it was really difficult for new writers and new voices to get their books published. So at one time, prior to 1995, an author could have a, a four or five book deal. And the publisher would, a bit like in the music industry, um, you know, book one or album one would introduce the writer or musician to the to the, to, to the market. But and by books two and three or albums two and three, they would then start making money for the publisher. But after 1995, after the netbook agreement went, the first book had to sell. Uh, and you can see now uh, publishing deals, if, if the author's first book doesn't make any money, they're dropped. Uh, yeah. We have lots of well-known authors come to us and they've been dropped by their bigger publishers because the sales graph was going in the wrong direction. So after 1995, the whole industry changed. It became really, really risk averse. I remember talking to the library suppliers, as I said, about you know what, what the bigger publishers were producing. And he said, it's kind of like blamalness. There's nothing great in there. So um, we decided, Heather and I decided that we would, uh, I'd won a competition, by the way, um, a, a writing competition. Uh, and I was whisked down to London and I met the um, director of Macmillan and an agent uh, and it all went pear-shaped. I did a stupid thing. Um, and the agent's name, she had a double barrel name and I got it wrong. Uh, and she didn't really speak to me for the rest of the meeting. At a really swanky restaurant um, uh -huh. called the Ivy in London where the Beckhams go and stuff like that. So I, was stu I did a, a very kind of stupid middle-aged northern male thing. Was I just got drunk uh, and decided to steal a table... Uh, a napkin uh, with the name of the ad on it. And I got kind of like thrown out, but took my way back in. Anyway, so I'd written a book. A year after that, I'd read in the bookseller, which is the Bible for um, for writers, that all the big money was going to uh, Irish writers. So I changed my name to Colm O'Driscoll and sent <laughs> the first three chapters in the synopsis to uh, Dali, uh, Dali Anderson, who's Lee Child's author, uh, agent, sorry. And he loved what I'd written. I'd written a book called Antils and Stars, and it was about hippies moving into the Calder Valley in Hebden Bridge in the late 60s, because uh, my nan lived in Todman and it was based around Todman. Uh, and he loved it, uh, but I had to speak to him for a year and pretend to be Irish. I even <laughs> lied to my children, my boys, and said that if a posh man from London rings up uh, and wants to speak to Colm O'Driscoll, that's me, your dad, I'm not kidding. <laughs> that's just horrendous, isn't it, lying to your children? Anyway, um, they couldn't sell my book because comedy 
wasn't selling at the time. Again, going back to the netbook agreement, all the big publishers really liked the book, um, but said that they couldn't sell 20,000 units. Um, and so we, we started Bloomers really, and this was a, a bit of a vanity project, you know, I won't lie, to get my story out there. But I didn't want it to be purely about uh, my book. So we published another book um, by a Canadian author called uh, Nathan Vanek called uh, The Bridge Between. So we published those two books. We remorg Heather and I remortgaged our house in yeah. Hendon Bridge to start the company in 2006. And we started with those two books. Well, Kev, can I just stop there? Those two books you must have had. You Sorry? must have just had. You must have had such a strong belief in your dual capabilities, the two of you, to remortgage your house. Yeah, I mean, one of the. I mean, you could say it was delusional and stupid because it was a, a year before the financial crash. But I've, I've been. I mean, I sound like Danny Laruna, but I've been working in publishing for twenty odd years, so I knew all the key contacts. I knew all the main buyers in Waterstones. I knew all the main buyers in the library suppliers. I knew the yeah. buyers in the supermarkets. So I knew all those people to talk to about books. And I knew how the, the kind of the, the, the structure of the industry works. Um, so I knew that if we, having spoken to kind of booksellers and librarians, I knew that what readers want is great new stories. Uh, and, I, and I thought that I kind of I knew what, I, this sounds a bit arrogant, I don't know what readers want. But because we've got a great team of editors, I don't edit. Heather edits, Leonora edits, Lynn edits, Annie, Annie uh, uh, edits. But we all got really different reading tastes. So I knew that if we if we put, if we if a book came to us and we all liked it for different reasons, then we could find a readership. Um, yeah. You know, it was my job then to go out and, and convince booksellers and librarians and supermarkets and library suppliers that, you know, these books were worth buying. So that's why we kind of remorgaged the house and we put and, and simply you know, I have, we haven't published a book by me since so you know it's not all vanity um you know we've had tremendous successes along the way and it's in August it'll be 15 years since we since we started um, and it just proves that if you work in collaboration with independent bookshops with librarians with libraries you can find readers for your books for your stories and, and that's yeah. what we continue to do on one set on one hand Publishing is really easy. Find great books and get them into readers' hands. And again, if, if you've got people who are passionate and engaging like libraries and librarians and independent booksellers, they're speaking to their customers every day. Yeah. And if you can you know, convince them that you've got a great story, which I think we have and continue to have, then they will do the job for you. We always, I always get a manuscript of a book we're going to publish into several booksellers' hands about eight months before we're actually publishing it so that they get excited about the stories we're going to publish. And they're telling their customers months in advance, oh, there's a great book by Blue Moose or, or whoever. So they're kind of like doing the, the sales and marketing for us. So, yeah. But that's why we started, to find great new stories. Because yeah. having worked in London, there's a, no one talks about it, but there's a huge glass class problem. Yeah. Um, I still get it now. You, know, you open your mouth and people think you're kind of dim because you're from the north. But working class writers were finding it increasingly difficult to get their books published because there is a metropolitan elite still mm. in kind of publishing and within London. And so those voices that weren't particularly talking about, you know, the North or whatever, but they were writers from the North talking about stories from around the world, just weren't getting their stories published. So we decided to go and find some great writers. And, you know, in the first four or five years, quite a lot of our writers were based from the North. But now our writers from, are from all over the world. So yeah, that's how we started. The, the other thing that really stood out for me as I got to know you was was one of the things that, that happened at the time, you know, when, when you were talking about publishers being risk averse, they were instantly just going to what the people that you refer to as the orange headed celebrities yeah. on your website. And, you know, for an unknown person, for a northern person, for a working class person who's talented, you just can't compete, can you, with no. with. No. you know celebs who are, who are probably not even writing their own books let's face it a lot of the time yeah and you know part of the uh, i mean we're in the entertainment industry part of the problem is if you've got a new voice is getting in front of the camera getting them on radio getting reviews getting them in the newspapers mm -hmm. um uh, and so you can't you know we've never had a, a a writer on good morning britain or whatever um but what we we did do i just thought if we start kind of local if we work with Kirkley's libraries, if we work with Calderdale libraries, if we work with Manchester libraries, if we work with Leeds libraries, if we work with all the independent bookshops in a, you know, a 50 mile region, if we speak to the Manchester Evening News, if we speak to the Yorkshire Post, build it that way, 
And then here's where the arrogance and delusion is. London will catch up eventually. And they did. And they, yeah, did, they did. You know, And now literary editors from, you know, the, the big newspapers contact me, you know, every two or three weeks to say, you know, what have you got coming out? Before, you couldn't even get them to, you know, answer your phone call or email. You know, we had to go and stalk them. No, I didn't. We didn't go and stalk anyone. <laughs> um, and that's because, um, to a certain extent, the industry was within kind of, you know, the M25. So they didn't have to really go looking for anything. People were making yeah. money. But when we started being shortlisted for prizes, when we started winning prizes, then, you know, the London publishing uh, establishment had to kind of look up and think, well, you know, they're doing something. What are they doing that readers love, that prize judges love, that the bigger publishers can't do? And what we're doing is we're investing in new voices and in the writing careers of, of, of writers, uh, which I don't think the big five really do. You know, the Penguins, the Macmillans, whatever. Um, one of the lovely things I think that we do is that we work from book one to, you know, to the end of a writer's career. Um, and, and that's that's what I'm passionate about is, is, is you know, is de developing a relationship, not only a, a professional publishing relationship, but a kind of writing relationship with writers cause, to help them get better. And I think that's one of the reasons why smaller indies like Blue Moose, like uh, Gally Beggar, like Another Stories, like Comma and People Tree are winning these prizes because we spend an inordinate amount of time working with writers on the ed editing. You know, it can yeah. take two years before a book comes out sometimes. Because if, if I'm asking a reader to spend £9.99 on a book, it's got to be the best it can be. Yeah. And that's why yeah. we spend a lot of money on our jackets as well, because you can judge a book by its cover. Yeah. I mean, the the, the thing that, that struck me as well with, with the Bloomers books, and I've got a lovely little collection myself, not behind me at the moment, but... Um, uh, apart from the fact that they look stunning, they look there's, there's not a single, you know, cover of yours that you've done that isn't a wow. It's I can't box them easily into a genre. Now with all the other publishers, the you know the the big publishers, the instant thing that you have to think about as a writer is how do I hammer myself into their genre? Because if I can't, if I go, oh, well, actually, it's a bit of romance and it's a bit of this. And then they go, well, actually, who do you think you are? You've got to either be this or this. Mm -hmm. Whereas with with your books, I, I, you know, I can't easily say that Blue Moose books do boom, boom, boom. How, how would you describe that to, to an author that would be wanting to make a submission to you? I mean, someone said to me, you know, what is a Blue Moose book? And there are no genres. I mean, when I was working in sales and marketing, we'd go down to WH Smith's in Swindon. And they'd say, no, we can't have that jacket because it doesn't say this. You know, it's a, not a crime. It's, it's this or that. A blue moose, there is no such thing as a blue moose book. Uh, yeah. What we do and pride ourselves is publishing cracking stories that are beautifully written. Now, that could be kind of like science fiction or that could be kind of crime or whatever. Um, a blue moose book, we, I would like to think that, you know, we guarantee that when you finish reading that book, it's engaged you and it's got you asking questions. And it's excited you and, it, you know, you might get a bit upset here and there, but you will have spent a wonderful time with a Bloomers book. So, um, and I think we, you have to give a bit of credit and now to readers that, you know, sometimes they don't need, uh, you know, a box in a, in a bookshelf to say, you know, mm -hmm. this book is about crime uh, from Manila or whatever. You know, just say this is brilliant literary fiction. Yeah. Uh, read it. How would you describe literary fiction then? I think literary fiction is more character driven. It's driven through the characters and how they address the, the situations that they're confronted with. Uh, and this is very simplistic. And, you know, there are always uh, differences and nuances of opinion. But I think, uh, you know, literary fiction generally is character driven, whereas genre fiction is plot driven. Um, yeah. And that's the kind of that's how I go about it. But, you know, you can kind of mix and match. And I'm not a kind of I will read everything and anything uh, and we will publish, you know, Anything that excites us, we'll publish. I remember having a discussion with, with Heather once about the kind of writing that I do. I mean, I'm, I'm one of these weird hybrid authors. I mean, I'm doing I'm doing history, you know, almost academic -y kind of history, and then I'm doing comedy. I remember saying, well, you know, Bloomers would never take my books because I, I just write 
you know, humour. And she was horrified. <laughs> she said, yeah. no, that's what... Because, and then I think you said, yeah, but, you know, your book, which I absolutely loved, Until and Stars, you know, so you said, that's humorous. And, yeah. and I just wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, your humour. And I know, and again, this is, you can't, there is no recipe really uh, obvious recipe for blue moose books but i know that you worked with les dawson many many years ago and that's yeah. I think, and i think your humor and your attitude just shines through and again you know without wanting to stereotype people from the north because mm. lots of us are very dour faced and miserable but most of us you know have a great sense of humor i think again you know without being too general i think you can't take yourself too seriously um in, in, in kind of any walk of life i think you know and if you can be self-deprecating uh, not to kind of abuse or bully anyone uh, uh, and you know les dawson was a great wordsmith i mean the tragedy of les dawson's life was that he wanted to be an, he wanted to be a novelist you know he left manchester in his 20s and he went to paris to write on you know the reeve on the left bank because he was a, a brilliant wordsmith i mean i remember him saying to me he was talking about the assistant stage manager and he called him an asinine doll and I didn't know what asinine meant. Uh, and so, it, but he, he's, he's just that, his command of the English language was, was phenomenal. I mean, my favourite writer is P.G. Woodhouse. Now, P.G. Woodhouse probably wouldn't get published today because he's seen as a comic writer, but there's no better constructor of a sentence in the English language. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, again, it's something that, actually, I think if you looked at Google searches for books, and I know with the libraries as well, that the number of people searching for something humorous and, and you know, that, that it's got comedic value yeah. compared to the actual books available. And I don't know whether, I never know whether that's because very few people can transport their humor into words or mm -hmm. whether they're just not getting published. I don't know, mm -hmm. but that's, that's a, something for another day. I wondered whether you could maybe talk us through for the authors, but I'm sure um, the readers listening will also be interested, the actual publishing process with yourself. Because having done it myself, um, I, I, I don't even explain it to people because it's so painful, especially when you, you know, you're, you're doing it on your own or in a small team. But I think it'd be really enlightening for people if you can maybe sort of talk, you know, talk through the process from A to Z. Okay, well, so how we publish a book or... Yeah, when so it like, comes to you. So, yeah. Um, the so manuscript. A, someone will leave... What we ask for on the website is the first three chapters and a synopsis um, and a covering letter. Uh, and then and then if I, I, I will read that those first three chapters and the synopsis. And then if I really like what I've read and it kind of gets me excited, then I'll ask for the full manuscript. And I'll ask for the full manuscript on paper because I can't read... A novel on the screen so i ask for the full manuscript uh on paper uh, that i'll read it and then i'll pass it on to lynn uh, and heather uh, and leonora and if we come to a consensus that this book has got something i mean sometimes some of our editors don't particularly like the way a, a book is written or they might not like the kind of some of the characters but if we all feel that it's got something yeah then i will offer uh, we will offer uh, the author a, a contract uh, and within that contract it's a standard um uh, contract and i always say to our uh, debut writers or writers run it past the society of authors which is the kind of writers trade union it costs 68 pounds a year to join um and run it past their legal department because we don't want to be mm -hmm. you know scamming everyone and i want the yeah. writer to be at ease so run it past them and then we say that um it might take up to 24 months before the book goes uh, onto the bookshelf. And I also say to the writers, now you, you, you've handed in your manuscript. This is where the hard work starts. This is where the rewriting starts. So we'll give the uh, author, we'll give the, uh, the author uh, an editor. And that editor will work with the writer for the first six months. And they'll do um, a line by line edit. They'll do a structural edit make sure that kind of timelines etc are, are in place uh, and to get it all knitted together and that's you know we're not telling a writer um how to do the rewrite i think the best editors and i think we've got some of them what they do they will ask the writer questions about certain aspects of their book and then mm -hmm. the writer will go away and think about it and then come back with the rewrite and then they'll have sorted the problem out so it's a collaboration and it's a cooperation and we work together so th those six months we work with um um, a, a structural edit after six months we will bring two more editors in then to really kind of finesse do the typos 
make sure it's the best it can be. So a writer can be working for 12 months just editorially. Mm. Um, after six months, we'll get kind of proofreaders into proofread. Uh, and after six months, I will ask a designer. I will send the design. I always ask, and this is a really good exercise for any writers out there. Can you put together a 50-word blurb about what your book is about? Um, the blurb on the back of the book that's in the bookshop. Do a 50-word blurb and a five bullet points about your book. Uh, and, and then I will send that blurb and the bullet points. I'll do my own blurb and bullet points and send it to the designer. The designer then will talk to me and the author about what we kind of want, what we're looking at. Um, and then they will send me seven designs and between me and the uh, author, we will pick a, a one design and then we'll work that one design and that's the jacket. So we'll have a jacket cover four months before publication. Um, so four months before publication, um, we will have proof copies made. So these are uncorrected proofs. I've got a, an uncorrected proof of a book we're publishing in September, which is called Three Graves by Sean Gregory. It's a novel about uh, Anthony Burgess. So four months before publication, we, I will send these proofs out to literary editors at The Guardian, The Times, Sunday Times, the Irish Times, etc., and to reviewers and to bloggers and to bookshop managers, uh, influencers, bloggers, bloggers, etc. So we'll send about 100 of those out to get the buzz and the momentum going about that book. Uh, four months before publication, it goes to the typesetters. We use typesetters based in Lancaster called Carnegie Publishing. They will typeset the book. The book will then be sent to uh, the author, me, and the editor, and the other editors. We will then proof it again. Uh, and, and Lynn Webb, who you know, is the queen of grammar. She and is. And she kind of nails everything. Uh, if it doesn't get past Lynn, we're not publishing it. Yeah. Um, and then two months before publication, uh, it will go to the printers. And we will have finished copies uh, two months before publication date, and they'll be in our warehouse. Our warehouse is based in Milton Keynes, and they send books uh, ev everywhere across the globe. Uh, so two months before publication, the books will be in the warehouse. Um, two months before publication, I'm talking to literary editors, I'm talking to reviewers, I'm sending press releases out. I'll have gone round when we can to various bookshops and talked up that book to various people. And that's when the kind of the orders will start coming from pre-orders. If you can and can afford it, if you can pre-order a book from a publisher's website, that is brilliant because we don't have to give any right. discount. More money comes to the writer, more money comes to the publisher, which means we can invest in new writers again and again and again. Uh, and so then we build up a kind of orders before actual publication day. And then when publication day comes, we will have a launch, usually where the author lives, their hometown or whatever. In the last year, it's been online. We have our own Zoom channel called the Blue Moose Deli, and we've been launching online. Uh, and so that's how, that's how the process of our book is published. That's brilliant. Thank you for explaining that. I don't think people who who, are, who know anything about the book industry realise just how, you know, how long that chain is. Um, so that's been really helpful. And and as well, just to say, I mean, I didn't realise as well how helpful it is to small independent publishers like Blue Moose pre-ordering is. So if you want to go away with one action today, pre-order books. It helps yeah. everybody. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about... Um, other ways of sort of helping the, the small independent mm. publishers and booksellers as well. But I just wanted to ask you, in terms of, it's really difficult because I'm, I'm sure when you get interviewed, Kevin, people say to you, well, what's your favourite yeah. book then? And it's really unfair to ask you that. But yeah. how would you say the, the kind of books that you initially published, have they changed at all? Or would you still say it's the same sort of shape of, of creative output? I think it's the... Um... It's the same creative output, excuse me. Um, I still think we publish great new voices uh, that are telling wonderful stories that the mainstream publishers are overlooking. Mm. Uh, if you know, we published Leonard and Hungry Paul, we've sold 45,000 copies of that. We published it in 2019. Last year, four of the biggest publishers in the UK were speaking to me, trying to buy that book for huge sums of money. Um, because then, for whatever reason, they kind of missed it. They missed that book, you know. Um, we've just found out in the last week that Gallows poll about the, the Cragwell coins, which we published in 2017, which Benjamin Myers, we published two of his previous books, 
Um, he has an agent, but none of the London publishers wanted to publish uh, the Cradwell Chronicles. Mm. That went on to win um, the world's largest literary prize for historical fiction, the £25,000 Walter Scott Prize. And now it's been made into a two-series yeah. BBC show called The Gallus Boat, directed by Shane Meadows. Um, uh, we published it's Pig Iron by... I know it is. Uh, and today I've just signed another film deal, which I'll talk about not tonight because I can't. But but if I go back to we published Ben Meyer's first book, Pig Iron, he had a two yeah. book deal with um, Picador, which is part of Macmillan. Um, and that book is about a, a, a family of, of travellers based in the northeast of England. And they refused to publish that book because his editor said, who would be interested in a, a working class character from a small northern town? And that small northern town is Durham, the theological capital of Europe for two and a half thousand years. And why wouldn't readers want to read about a working class character? So you can see in that one comment from that editor where publishing was then and still yeah. is now. Now, if they'd have published Ben, they'd have still been publishing his books now. If I tell mm. you we licensed um, when Ben went to Bloomsbury because we couldn't afford his next book, The Offing, um, because Bloomsbury had Harry Potter gold to give to him. And I would have, you know, Ben let us know all the way through the process that this is yeah. what's going to happen. So that's that's fine. Uh, yeah. That's part of the commercial process of publishing. But the offing which they published uh, last year um, is now one of the biggest selling books in Germany. He sold over 120,000 copies in Harbach in Germany, which is just phenomenal. Picador yeah. could have had those kind of sales in the UK. But because of their narrow-minded, their... I would imagine their own life, I don't know, not all, I might even say kind of life skills, but their life experiences, their reading experiences, coming from a, a certain background, going to certain universities, they wouldn't really know what existed yeah. outside their very comfortable and narrow reading habits. What, you know, they've lost out on kind of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds of the business by an editor saying that in 2011. We published Pig Iron and it won the, um, uh, inaugural Gordon Byrne Prize, and Ben's won mm. several prizes since. And I think we're still doing that. You know, Sharon's book, which we published, Sharon Dougal, which we published in October, yeah. should we fall behind, um, was picked up and uh, and was chosen by BBC Two's new uh, uh, book program called Between the Covers, and it was one of six new books. So we had prime time TV coverage a couple of weeks back. It was then shortlisted for the Royal Society of Literature's Encore Award. Uh, you know, Sharon's books weren't picked up by anybody. Um, and you, you can see that, it, again, it's what I think is finding great new voices and great stories that the bigger publishers are kind of scared of. Again, it's going back to that being risk averse because mm. they've got, first of all, they've got an economic imperative to keep their shareholders happy with more money. Yeah. Whereas our literary imperative is an editorial imperative to get the best books we can possibly get with the best stories and the best writing and then give them to readers. And readers are saying, yeah, well, I actually quite like that. That's, I'd rather read that than some blancmange published by Penguin Random House. I think it shines through a lot more. I mean, I, I said, I've said to, this to you previously, you know, I lack patience in, in many spheres of life, but in terms of my own writing, having sub submitted it to a very large publishing house and got fantastic feedback, which was basically, that's a great book, but you need to de-northernify it. And, yeah. you know, as though, as though I'd been writing about flat caps and whippets or something, you know, and I just thought, no, I'm not doing that. And you could say, well, maybe that's arrogance. Maybe you're not doffing your cap up to, you know, the yeah. Oxford Cambridge London Triangle, but that's the, I don't think that's arrogance. I think that's a, a huge pride in where you come from and in your own art and in your own talent. And, and yeah, maybe you'll never will, you know, sell a million or something, but you've got to almost have this conviction in your own worthiness and your own talent and, you know, never sort of resting on your own laurels. And I think that's exactly what you've done. You've just, that's why I asked about the consistency of your earlier books yeah. to the later books and I would without if somebody said to me I've never read a blue moose book which one would you recommend well I would be going well you know these early ones they're fantastic and those ones and, and the ones in the middle and I'd really struggle because there's something from that entire range for everyone 
and that's why I think it's great that you don't want to box yourself in with genre because I would I would say to anybody watching this now if you've never read a Blue Moose book there will be one that just changes your perspective on the world it might not be the first one you read but it'll be one of the, the earlier ones that you actually do pick up because mm. there are scenes in all of your books that stay with me um, you know, regardless of, of who it's written by and where they come from in the country and their class background or whatever, you just got you've got this knack for picking brilliant writers who, like you say, in, in new voices. Well, well on, on uh, between the covers on the BBC Two program, they had a panel of celebrities, and Vic Hope was one of the celebrities who read Sharon's book, um, Should We Fall Behind? And there's a character in there called Nikos, uh, and he's originally from Cyprus, and he's a bit of a kind of grumpy old man, and he, he can be quite nasty and a bit of a bully. And she, she was asked, which character did, did you uh, relate to most and like most? And she said, strangely enough, it's Nikos, who I hated at first. But then I read, mm -hmm. and then because of the way Sharon un, unravels and reveals his his backstory and the traumas yeah. that he's been through, she said she finding out loving him and, and, and crying because she realised the, the way he was was because of, of what had happened in the past. And that's yeah. a, a great talent that a writer can do that slowly reveal why someone is valiant because everyone has a story no one comes fully formed into the world uh, yeah. you know and, and sometimes you know someone might be being particularly horrible to you but invariably there's a story behind that you know i think sometimes we're all far too judgmental aren't we and again that's why lending a hungry paul has resonated with so many people especially in the pandemic because it's a it's a quiet book it's a book about yeah. two quiet men who normally would be overlooked and they how they get through life is by just offering small bits of kindness. And I think yeah. in the last 12 months, if there's one thing we've all learned is that we need to collaborate and cooperate with each other. Otherwise, you know, everything's going to do while it's happening. It? Well, I think that comes across really well. And if there was if there was one kind of way that we could package Blue Moose, it would be, as you say on your website, you are a family. You know, yeah. you might not be blood relatives, but obviously having yeah. known you a long time, and I know your editors really well as well. Yeah. And I just think... That is the, that is the ingredient, you know. When you're looking at a massive publishing house, they don't have that. They have a massive staff turnover. You've mm -hmm. got this beautiful consistency of people who would just, you know, they they do it for the love of of writing and reading. And mm -hmm. I think that's you know, and and all very you know, they're my friends. So you know, I, I can say this really amazingly mm -hmm. generous, kind people who mm -hmm. who have got phenomenal talents between them. And I think it's the on it is often you know you and the editing team who are the unsung heroes. I you know that's just the way it is in writing, isn't it? But mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you really are, and that's what, that's why I've wanted to focus a little bit on this today because yeah, well, it's I mean, that I, process. I mean, I can because I'm I mean I've got a gob on me, so I'm usually the face of humans, <laughs> but. The most important people in, in Blue Moose are the editors. You know, they're the yeah. ones who are working day in, day out with the writers and making the, you know, the, the writer's stories the best they can be. You know, we should have more awards for editorial and, yeah. and, and, and editing. Because, uh, you know, right. without them, you know, Blue Moose wouldn't exist, period. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, they are the unsung heroes. And um, I think that kind of leads me on to my next question which is obviously with your with your professional career background being in sales and marketing which has just been you know the bee's knees for blue moose but also writing how do you exercise that that writing part of your of yourself do, have you kind of put it on the back burner for now have you got plans to return to it are you quietly scribbling away at the moment it's the it's the kind of imposter syndrome it's kind of when i'm publishing <laughs> fantastic writing i'm thinking I was going to oh no! Oh, no, but um, yeah, I am still. There is a sequel. It's fifteen years late. Um, what? <laughs> to I've just books. been waiting a long time for it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I still do write. But um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm a hypocrite because I always say to writers and authors, you know, every day at least do you know twenty minutes, half an hour. And sometimes <laughs> I don't. I don't even do that. But I am still writing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad. I think we're, there's quite a few of us are just sitting there waiting for it. You know, at what point will Kevin go? Right, okay, it's my turn now. I'm going to get back yeah. into this. How is it? How is it? Yeah, well, come on. We, we, yeah, we're on 16 now, aren't we? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just a couple more years. Um, how how would you say things have changed for you over the last year? I mean, obviously, normally, you know, you get wheeled out to the events with the drinky poos and all that, and you've not been able to do that. You were just saying before we, we started the, mm. the chat now that it's been your best year at Blue Moose. 
and and I think that's just down to you and the team and, and, and your writers anyway. But obviously the pandemic will have had an influence on that. Um, what what's helped? Would you say? Yeah, I think. Um, you wanted to read stuff. Yeah, March the twenty third uh, last year was just a cliff face. Um, yeah. But what was wonderful was lots of independents worked with independent bookshops because we realised that you know that this could be a catastrophe. Uh, yeah. and, and I personally put out a call out of arms out on, on Twitter and social media saying, um, if you can, please, can you buy um, the Blue Moons books if you want to from the Blue Moons website? And so yeah. people were brilliant. I know the default is to go to Amazon uh, because they are all uh, encompassing and consuming. And, you know, they do are very, very price competitive. But I just put out a call to arms and say, you know, if you can, can you order books because you know we could be going under and the reading public were just phenomenal and they bought books in their thousands from our website which was just fantastic um and they've continued to do so as i say it's, as you said it's it's been our best year ever um and what's been really lovely for me and everyone at blue moose is that after that initial kind of like peak of people saying yeah you know we're going to help you out we'll buy your books They've then come back to Blue Moose and gone through the backlist. And they've been sending us photographs of Blue Moose bookshelves from around the world, from America, um, from South America, from Japan, Australasia, from Africa. And they've now got like 10, 15 books. And they're sending us these kind of uh, Blue yeah. Moose bookshelves, which is just brilliant. And it's really kind of heartening um, that they are, you know, they, they've, they've helped us out with, say, a new book that we published last year. But then they've come back because they've liked it so much by our backlist and, and and as every publisher knows it's the backlist that keeps you going you know the, the new books the big shiny one that everyone sees in the newspapers that's almost like just you know the book in the shop window what keeps us going is people buying yeah. our backlist and that, that has been phenomenal in fact the, the website has been our best-selling bookshop for 12 months and we've you know our sales have increased phenomenally which is just lovely yeah that's fantastic I've got, um, I think there's a question here that's just pinged up from yep. John Wheatley. Have Kevin and Blue Moose been snowed under with submissions this year? No, not the same as every year. Uh, right. It hasn't increased substantially. Um, yeah. Perhaps people have been too busy writing. Perhaps I'll get them what? submissions next year or the year after. And that's one of the reasons why I know some independent publishers only have, their only submissions are only open for a month. But I'm kind of really greedy. We're open all year round because I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss a gallows pole. I don't want to miss a Leonard Rose yeah. pole. I don't want to miss should we fall behind um, because it's it's the little gems that just drop it. We to last week, um, a, a lady called Elizabeth Heichelbeck from Boston, Massachusetts, sent me an email that just said Chopin in Kentucky. And that just grabbed me, and I read the synopsis, asked for the full book. We're going to publish that book uh, in January 2023. It is just one of the best yeah. book submissions I've read. And so I think yeah, people are just keep putting in submissions. Uh, I mean, I do get a lot. Uh, we probably get 10 submissions a day. Um, so, But it's not that many more than I, we would have got last year or the year before, to be honest. 10 a day. Yeah. And and how how would you manage authors' expectations if you could give them a few words of advice? Um, obviously, you know, most of us authors being very tender, sensitive souls, yeah. it, it, um, it's deep rejection. Well, the, the brutal the, the brutal expectation is that only four percent of writers make the minimum wage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, lot, if you're writing to become a millionaire, stop. Nope. If you're writing <laughs> because you want your story to be read because you think you've got something to say, that's brilliant. And you yeah. can become, you can make money out of it. But your, you know, your desire and the reason why you want to write is because you want to get a story down and tell people about it. Um, uh, you know, yeah. some of our authors do make a reasonable living. Uh, but yeah, if you're, if you're writing for money, then you're in the wrong game. Um, you should be writing. Yeah, and it's, you know, there are a lot of people out there competing for, time you know uh, you know and why you know why should a reader pick up your book rather than someone else's book and that's the challenge all publishers have isn't it that's why mm. we're competing and uh, that's why we have great jackets to say no pick this book i think 
one of the things that people also maybe who have heard about Blue Moose don't realise that you publish fiction and non-fiction, which again is yeah. quite unusual for you know a small yeah. publishing house. Yeah, and I've I mean, been, we, I've we, been we, talking- we haven't done that much non-fiction of late, but we're going to kind of mm-hmm. relaunch the non-fiction this next year because we've got two cracking books coming out next year, which I can't talk about. But yeah, so we're having a, a proper non-fiction list next year or relaunching it next year. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's just. If people have got again it goes back to stories doesn't it we all want stories and i think over the last 12 months in the pandemic that's why more and more people are reading is because they 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 feel a safety in, in, in a story that they need to kind of like jump into get away from the anxiety of today and disappear into a story uh, uh, and that's what we hope to do i missed that question was it wasn't a, well through. i read it very fast but it was um um Hester, Hester Dunlop she says it's ironic I'm not right. able to watch this live all the way through as I'm off okay. to book club just to say I love the Blue Moose catalogue and I thank you for bringing yeah. such fab authors to our attention good yeah, old Hester, Hester thank you yay <laughs> Kev can you maybe explain because I, I like I say it, you know no judgment on people here because we all do what we have to do in different ways but you mentioned like you know and I've always told people to to buy through the Blue Moose um, website, but mm-hmm. also in terms of it, we've got um, independent bookshop week coming up very yeah. soon, which is one of the reasons we wanted to do this session. Um, and where I live, we've got Read Home for Earth, which is just you know fantastic bookshop. If you've never been to Read Home for Earth, you've got to visit. But also you can order online, and mm-hmm. their website will tell you everything about them. Do you still spend time yourself cultivating those relationships yes. with? Um, um, those, there's very few independent bookshops that we still have. Well, it's essential. And as I said before, you know, without independent yeah. bookshops, we probably wouldn't be here because sometimes we can't compete with the huge discounts that the high street bookshops uh, are asking for. So, you know, we work hand in hand with the bookcase in Hebden Bridge, Book Corner in Halifax in the Peace Hall, The Grove in Ilkley, uh, Drake Bookshop in Stockton on Tees, Little Ripon Bookshop, uh, Little Toller down in Dorset. Forum Books in Corbridge, Golden Hair in Edinburgh, um, Bookish Prick in Krakow. Uh, there's, 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 you know, there's, there's a hundred and there's a thousand and twenty independent bookshops in the UK, and we try and work with all of them and have a conversation with them all the time. Uh, and social media is great with, with that. But yeah, uh, if I just, you know, one going back to the Gallows poll, um, Waterstones, when we published that in 2017, by an award-winning author, Benjamin Mike, they ordered 85 copies of the Gallows Poll. We sold 2,000 copies of the Gallows Poll between two small independent bookshops, the bookcase in Hebden wow. and the book corner in the Peace Hall. 2,000 copies. Now, I didn't go to the head of marketing at Waterstones and said, what are you doing? You're a bookshop. If I can sell 2,000 copies of a book yeah. in these two small indie bookshops, what are you doing? You should be selling that in Leeds, Waterstones. These two bookshops could fit into the cafe in Leeds. I've really That's seen a-, a change the last five years because because um, in my other life, I do a lot with um, you know farmers, producers, people who are trying to sell locally and regionally. And when you talk about buying local, everybody thinks eggs jam biscuits meat mm. and people don't think books and i think finally the last few years i've really seen people waking up to that yeah. certainly in my part of the world where i live i mean a lot of that will be thanks to you and mm. your team yeah. but do, do you feel that people are maybe waking up to that a little bit more and, and realize that the so. books i think yeah. um, because amazon is all pervasive and mm. the default is oh if i have to buy online i can't go out I'll, you know, I'll go to Amazon. But I think with the restrictions and people not being able yeah. to travel, uh, and if you want a physical book, yeah, you can go to Amazon, uh, whatever. Um, but I don't think they invest in the community like we do, you know, paying taxes and, and things like that. Um, but I think, you know, independent bookshops now are kind of cultural communities. Um, and, you know, when, when I go and visit all the indie bookshops, someone will pop in and they'll buy a book or they might not buy a book. But they're having a chat with the owner and stuff like that. And they're almost like, I won't say like the drop-in centres, but that kind of camaraderie uh, amongst the kind of the book community um, is fostered by the independents. And Amazon can't do that. Amazon yeah. can't do recommendations. They can say, you like that, you might like this. But what independent bookshops do brilliantly, and it cannot, 
one example today, a friend of mine went into the book corner in Halifax to um, get some books. One of his, uh, someone was a, doing a launch there and he wanted to buy Penenka by Ronan Hessian. Uh, but the bookshop had sold out of Penenka by Ronan Hessian. Um, they'd sold 45 copies in a week, hardback, which is brilliant. So Sarah, who's the manager at the book corner in, uh, in Halifax, sold her her own signed copy of Penenka because she didn't want that customer to leave <laughs> disappointed. Now, yeah. you know, Jeff Bezos can't do that on his £500 nope. million pound yacht, can he? But Sarah <laughs> did it at the book corner in Halifax. And that's what small independent bookshops can do, mean, and that value cannot be replicated by yeah. algorithms. Yeah. We, If the last 12 months has shown us anything, when we haven't seen people for 12 months, you know, speaking to a human is just really, really important. And that personal recommendation from someone you trust, be it a friend or a bookshop manager who's not trying to sell the latest book that's got a 70% discount it because Watertones have bought 4 billion of them and they have to get rid of them. Um, those personal recommendations matter. Uh, and and that, that cultural kind of like di diversity is from those personal recommendations, isn't it? Yeah. Here's a question. What's your favourite part of the publishing process? Is seeing one of our authors' uh, books on the bookshelf or seeing a picture of one of our authors sending me a picture of someone on a train or, oh, plane, yeah. or a bus of someone reading one of their books. That's brilliant. And they're not, I don't want to go all Simon Cowell and X Factor, you know, I'm the maker of dreams and all that. But it's that, you know, when you've seen, yeah. you've worked with someone for so long and then yeah. to see them, see yeah. what they've put their, you know, their heart and soul into and someone else is reading it, you know, and I not mean, for I show. Say the same. As, as a writer, there is nothing like feedback because, um, you know, just the fact that somebody's read it and even if it wasn't the best thing they've ever read, there'll be a bit of it that's touched them and they've had, they've just had the time and the kindness and the way with all just to give you some feedback and it's such i can't you know overestimate the difference to people's lives you know to, to your to your life you know to your own mental well-being you know we, we do we do what we do because we love it because we love books and we love writing and we want to create quality books but but also you know we're human beings who just invest more than we would it yeah. impacts anything else in our lives and and yeah that, that's a good question thank you and that's a great answer <laughs> what's the best mindset for a publisher to have there might be people out here wanting to do exactly as you've done kev so they, curiosity. curiosity it's got to be curious all the time yeah just be curious and i suppose that's probably uh you gotta have a thick skin uh and yeah. i suppose you gotta be a bit deluded <laughs> and you've got, and you've, got to, you've got to believe in those people around you. You've got to believe yeah. in the kind of the quality of your editors uh, uh, and believe in what you're doing. Yeah. So, do you yeah, find it, do you find it quite hard when you know? Because I know when I've well, obviously wouldn't do it on camera now, but I know when you and I are chatting, you'll say, "Oh, have you read? Have you read this one? Have you read that one? You've got to do." It. Do you find it quite hard when you're speaking to people to sort of to go through your own catalog and say you've got to read this, or have you read? Have you, you know, whatever you're talking about. Um, there's, there's a book that touches that subject. Do you find it quite hard not to do that, or do you just go and do it anyway? No, I do it any, do it anyway. Because <laughs> I do it, I do it if I do it if I wasn't publishing. If I'd read a book, I'd tell people about it. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I, I think, um, without going all kind of messianic about it, I just think um, the more people can read, uh, I think the better we will be. You know, if we yeah. if we can read about other people's experiences. That have had different lives to us, or, or you know, have been you know, different cultures, and that we can only become better people by trying to understand what they've gone through and what they're trying to tell us. The more we read, the more the better the better we become. I think. I know. Just just before, um, oh, there you go. Here's another one. How do you deal with author disappointments? Do you sometimes feel that authors don't realise you just can't publish everything? Yeah, it's difficult, especially when you published uh, an author and they're second novel comes through and you've really tried to work with it you spent a lot of time on it um but it's just not working and you can't publish it that's really really um disappointing but i think you've got to be honest and sometimes you've got to say to an author well that hasn't worked 
well, we don't think it's worked because again, it's taste and subjectivity. Perhaps put it away and and start again. But that's a mm -hmm. huge effort, and you know, some authors will, and we've had yeah. some authors run away and call me all the names under the sun. But if we're investing, you know, tens of thousands of pounds in a book, you know, we're not going to publish something because we've just published it before. It's got to be of a, a really good standard, mm. um, and as it should be. But it is difficult managing people's expectations. Oh, that's nice. Carol Warren sent a lovely comment there through. Thank you. She feels inspired. <laughs> that's good. That's good to hear. Um, I know before we became on air, you and I were chatting about how libraries have been decimated, how library services yeah. have been decimated. Yeah. And there's always this thing of should we be political, shouldn't we be political? Mm -hmm. But you know, the fact is, you know, that the funding has just been axed horribly. Yeah. And, you know, those of us that love libraries that have used them, we're not just passionate about keeping them for ourselves. Yeah. Most of us are passionate about getting them to be rediscovered by people or to be discovered for those that have not had, you know, a library born and bred upbringing like you and I because the parents couldn't afford to fill the houses with books um but um I mean that that's something that I wanted to to go back to really obviously you know we're doing our best to try and keep libraries going but are you aware that we're having a new library in um Kirklees Kev did fantastic. you know about this we've had a yeah. new library built in yeah. um in <laughs> Or the Berkeley way and right. it will be opening quite soon and I perhaps shouldn't do this uh, and I might get shouted at but I'd really like to invite you to come and to be one of the first people who from the publishing world to come and maybe speak there and inspire um, some some of our local residents if you wouldn't mind in the future. Thank you very much I'd love to do In that, a brand yeah. new library. <laughs> yeah, great um, I mean there's a there's, it's in law it's written in law in 1964 Library Act the government has got to deliver you know libraries and books to the community um, when this present government uh, you know over the last 11 years says that it's down to local government they're not giving local government enough money it's up to mm. the government to stand by that 1964 library act and give communities the buildings the staff not volunteers i've got nothing against volunteers but what we need is salaried library staff who know what they're doing who are professionals who've spent their lives uh, in libraries uh, and give them enough budget to fund uh, the acquisitions of new books ebooks audio books and libraries are communities i remember in 2012 going over to blackpool library with one of our authors and there was a lady there she was blind she came to her she took two buses to get to the library she said that's the only day she went out was to go to the library because the library staff would talk to her, would give her a cup of tea, and she'd really enjoy the event that was there. That library closed, so that, that blind lady didn't have anywhere to go. Libraries are essential parts of our community. And it's not just about books sometimes. I remember being in Central Library in Stockport, and there were safe places for people yeah. who were homeless to go to. Um, and that's important too. Not that kind of libraries should just be there for, for homeless people. But it was a safe place where people could go and read the newspaper. These are essential hubs of our communities. And again, if the last 12 months has told us anything, we need people and we need libraries and we need books and we need stories and we need to listen to people. So libraries are essential. As I said off air, without libraries at the beginning from 2006 to 2010, without libraries giving us free space, access to their book clubs, um, didn't charge us and allowing our, our writers to talk about their stories, we wouldn't be here. We just wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, and so it was essential when we started. And it's even more essential now, even though it's far more difficult uh, because they just don't have any money. So please, if you can, write to your local MP, write to your councillor, because it always seems when they're trying to cut anything, the library budget is the first one they go to. Yeah. It should be one of the last things they go to. So, yeah, and if you, can't, if, you can't, if you can't afford to buy a Blue Moose book and you're watching this, if you get one out from your local library, whether yeah. it's a real book yeah. that you can turn the pages off, whether it's an e-book, whether it's an audio book, not only will that keep the library going, every time when we can open again safely, um, you put your foot inside the door, you get anything out online, you're helping to keep the libraries open and you're also paying an author because there's a yeah. system where every time you check something out, the author gets an element of the royalties as well. So. Yeah. That's that's my evangelical bit over for the day. <laughs> and now we've come to the end of the hour. So um, right. 
Yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Kev, before we finish. No, that's good. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do part two at Birkby. Yay, fantastic. We'll get your books, get your diary out and, right. and we'll be in okay. touch. When we've got a big, we've obviously got to plan the big launch date and mm -hmm. that would be fantastic to get you over our well, way. Thanks very much for everyone who's kind of listened. But thank, uh, thanks to Nicola and thanks to you, Christina, for inviting me. Thank you. Lovely. Oh, thanks. Thanks for putting your time and thanks for your comment there, John. That's lovely. Cheers. Thank you. Take yeah, care, bye -bye. everybody. I think we're bye. leaving now, so have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.